Hi, Eli. Hey, Bob. How are you? Good. How are you doing? I'm great. I'm actually uh, broadcasting now from uh, Josh Lake, my cousin's apartment in Denver, Colorado. Wow. Denver. Yes. It's great out here. The air is free. It's the mountain state. It is. It is. It's, uh, it's a western state where liberty is prized. That's your kind of place. Yes. Well, um, I don't know, but it's, it's purple now, right? Well, we, yeah, we don't know. It's it's a, it's it's conceivably a swing state. We think yes. We're right. hoping it'll swing into the blue column. When I say we, I, don't, I of course don't mean to include you in that particular right. locution. So Eli, well, if Barack um, Obama cast a spell as uh, well as he did in Germany. Then who knows? Let's don't get. Uh, <laughs> there was a note of sarcasm, or at least irony, in that Eli. Well, they were very, they were very excited. The Germans were excited to see Barack Obama. Yeah. Well, so as I, I would imagine, how many Coloradans will be. Uh, possibly more excited than the Germans, I hope. The, uh, so, so, um, you're filling in for, uh, for the great blogger Mickey Kaus, Eli, you realize yes. that. Do you, do yes, you feel, do you feel worthy? Um, I, uh, I've been an admirer of Mickey Kaus's for a long time, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, I just hope I can live up to it. Well, it's, uh, we're setting the bar pretty high. Um, I, I, you know, if we wanted, we could spend the whole time talking about Jonathan Edwards, just, if you'd like. I think Mickey's got that. Into Ann Coulter. I think Mickey's got that beat covered, but thanks yeah. for offering. Um, so, uh, have you, uh, on your last dialogue, you announced that you had quit smoking. Is that still in effect? It's still in effect. And, uh, Congratulations. You'll see me, I don't have my cinnamon stick, but you'll see me smoking a pen. Okay. Well, that's or great. Or not smoking a pen, but, you know, pretending to smoke a pen. I mean, i got to say, I'm happy for the health effects and everything. It is for blogging heads a little bit of an aesthetic loss, you know? Because well, you, uh, there are, I can recommend other smokers who uh, who could maybe do this. I'll, I have to sort of think about it, but it's it's a good habit to quit. Well, here's what I was thinking: yeah. is maybe um, I don't want you to like start smoking again, but if you could just smoke one cigarette for us, Eli, I can't maybe? smoke one cigarette. You don't understand? I'm an addict. If I smoke one, I might as well smoke a thousand. But Eli, have you Not thought about how, how good it would feel for that life-giving smoke to enter your lungs? Have you just thought about it? Just think oh, about it. Oh, don't start with me, Bob, but it's not going to work because I've turned a corner. You know what would be a great reality show, yeah. reality TV show, is where you would sit there with a, an unlit cigarette in one hand and a cigarette lighter in the other, and I would try to say things that would so unnerve you. <laughs> Right, like I could, I could say, like you know, I think terrorism is basically a law enforcement problem, Eli. <laughs> and like each, you would, you would sort of like eat, like increase more yeah. and more, and then I, then at some right. point, like I would break down and have the cigarette. That's I see right. The, the, right. The next thing would, the next thing would be, you know, I think the trouble with Ahmadinejad is basically just that he has low self esteem, and if if we gave him some positive reinforcement, maybe you know, I would say things like that. Right. Right. It's really like the problem with Iran is just like the problem with like, you know, we need to reach out to gangs in their inner cities. That's the kind of thing I had in right, mind. Right. It's a failure to communicate. Do you think it would work? No, I don't, because i got to tell you, I've made a decision to stop smoking, and that's what I'm going to do. Nah. I mean, I just, you know, you know, I mean, it, it's one of these things where, uh, you know that commercial where they show the, uh, the coffee, the guy trying to drink coffee and he doesn't know how to do it? It's been so hard the last week. To, mm -hmm. to sort of just get your life patterns back together without smoking, mm -hmm. that I would—I just don't want to go do that again. You know what I mean? So I, right. I just—it's just I'm, you know, kind of, you know, just kind of go through, go, go through it, and and hopefully kind of put it behind. Mm -hmm. So is it what it causes a lot of like anxiety just to to be doing? You no, know, you, you used to. It's just I'm used to a certain amount. I'm used to smoking mm -hmm. a lot, as you could, as blogging heads viewers probably know. Right. Um, and uh, when when you're when you you need something to do with your hands and it's just you know and I'm chewing the gum and stuff but it's not really yeah, the same. It's not the, no, it's not the same. What would really feel good for you, I think, right now, Eli, is an actual cigarette. Because mm. you know, Bob, Bob it's not going to work. I mean, you could continue to go on, you know what I mean, but it's not going to work, you know. Well, it really is a loss, but I'm happy for you. Well, thank you very much. That would be I'm... funny though if you could sort of continue to to provoke me to provoke me, but I don't think it would work though. Because, you know, you sort of make a decision, you move on. Actually, not all smokers uh, handle it that way. As Mark Twain said, you know what Mark Twain said about smoking, right? What did Mark Twain say about smoking? He said, it's easy to quit. I've done it hundreds of times yeah, or right, something right, like that. Right. Classic, famous line. Okay. So, current events. Yes. Uh, the Olympics. You've heard about the Olympics. They're happening yes. in China. Yes. Bush is, well, for starters, he's not going to boycott the opening ceremonies, which, were you in favor of the boycott? Would you, were you agitating for that? 
Um, I mean, my newspaper was, and I certainly, you know, I, I, it, it, I think it would have been. It's, I think it's important if Bush can show some sort of solidarity with dissidents when he's in China. But the reality is that, given the fact that his diplomacy right now is so rap- needs China, you know, we, uh, you know, forget the the fact that they own a lot of American debt, the Chinese, but. Bush needs China for North Korea. He needs China for Iran. Um, so when you got to sort of ask yourself, well, what are your priorities? As much as I think it's important for a U.S. president uh, when they go to Beijing to um, show I, what I think is a sort of solidarity of the free world with people who are, who are seeking to liberalize China politically, um, you know, is that worth having the Chinese play the spoiler on another round of sanctions against the Iranians, uh, or you, you know, a UN resolution against Iran. I mean, I, I, I would say no, it's not worth it. Eli, I think you're on the path to enlightenment. You know, I have real hopes that someday you will not be a neocon. I think you're headed in that direction. I'm a neo neocon. Neo neocon, the next generation. In fact, from now on, I would prefer that we stop using the word neocon. Um, and I would like to call us the freedom community. <laughs> the freedom community. The freedom community. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, that's one of the more ambitious rebranding, uh, I don't know. That, just, that, that's just me. You know, if it, it, you know, take it or leave it. That's well, how I the, feel. The trouble with a new label is it lacks stigma. Well, you know? that's because you guys have tried to stigmatize neoconservative to mean, I don't know, Goebbelesque, you know, war criminal. I mean, I don't know. I mean, it just means evil now. And I don't, I obviously disagree with that. And I'm not saying you, Bob, right, but I'm saying that, there's been a lot of uh, literature about the neoconservatives that is, I think, pretty wrong and off the mark. And, you know, it's just, it's like you kind of repeat it, repeat it, repeat it, repeat it. And uh, so, you know, that's why I said, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm torn. On the one hand, I want to say, you know, fine, I'm a neoconservative, say what you mm-hmm. want. But on the other hand, you know, I'd like to think of it as a sort of larger freedom community. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, anyway, I'll be thinking of you as a neocon if it's okay. That's fine. In fact, you know, that's one reason I, I, you know, a little part of me regrets that you're not smoking, because you were doing a great job of being uh, our official neocon villain. I mean, we have a few neocons who come on the site. We've had, in fact, in the last couple of weeks, we've had uh, David Froman and Bob Kagan. But I kind of thought of you as, as, in a way, our designated villain, and the cigarette just, you know, just made it. Well, but I understand your Also, by the way, Noah Pollack, who, who's terrific, and he, I think we, he's just come out with one. I, um that he taped in my apartment, but, um, and Kagan, the Kagan one with Fukuyama was very interesting. It was very good. It was and very Frum good. And is always interesting. He was really, that was, that was a good dialogue with you. I mean, I, I, I can't really compete with Kagan and Frum. I mean, come on. I mean, those guys are legends. Uh, but if, uh, if you, if, I mean, I'm, was I a villain? Do you think I was a villain? I was not. No, I I was I'm kidding. Kind of, I'm kidding. I know. It's a joke. Goldfarb. Now, Goldfarb, when he was on the, on Blogging Heads. He was a good villain. He was a villain. Yeah. And funny. <laughs> but now he's a McCain guy. Yes, he is. Uh, yeah, he's messaging for McCain. Um, yeah. And, uh, well, actually, I mean, why follow any kind of script? Any thoughts on the McCain-Obama uh, thing? I mean, I, I think the momentum, I mean, the, the, the meme of the moment that's being to some extent successfully pushed by the McCain side is, wait a second, if things are going so bad for, you know, if things look so bad for any Republican candidate, why isn't Obama doing better in the polls? David Brooks wrote a column, lots right. of people are saying this, and there was just a piece in Politico saying Obama can't seem to get up to 50% in the polls, even if he's a few points ahead. So I think there, the, 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 the zeitgeist says momentum is kind of shifting to uh, Obama, if only in the sense that more and more people are thinking, hey, it's quite, plot, plot. I mean, shifting to McCain, if only in the sense that more and more people are saying it's, it's plausible that he could win. Well, I had thought for a while that, um, you know, I, I'm going to vote for McCain because, I, it, I mean, his opinions are very close to mine on a number of issues. But, I mean, I thought for a while that he was going to lose because that, you know, the Americans would punish the Republican Party uh, for the price of gasoline. And I thought that was going to be the salient issue. Now, as it turns out, the Democrats are so, are so into, you know, carbon credits and global warming and, you know, um, regulations and so forth, that it's difficult for them to take advantage of what I think would be the, the sort of main issue for the election. And McCain has retreated from uh, what might be called his sort of centrist view on these issues, and he's for uh, drilling, and the Republicans are for drilling. And I think that that issue is, is, gonna, it is resonating, and it would be an extraordinary uh, opportunity <laughs> loss. And I think that in some ways the Democrats need to move away from an Al Gore and move back to a John Dingell, if you know what I'm saying. 
Well, I don't exactly, but I have a question about this Remember, interview. You know, John thing. Diggle was like, you know, the big three auto companies. Like he was there. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You he know, was from yeah. there. He was from, he was from yeah. Michigan. The the uh, but but um, I have a question for you. I mean, it seems to me that your side. I mean, I think you're right about the the political opportunities right. here. Uh, there's got to be some mileage to be had by saying you will uh, lower gasoline prices, as as McCain is saying. But um, your side of the, uh, uh, I mean, what's the new word? You're not a neocon. You're a what? A freedom what? No, I just consider that there's sort of a large global freedom community. You're you're, includes, you're part of the freedom. It includes community. people striving for, um, you know, uncorrupted elections and free elections right. in Iran, right. and also it, it includes, you know, the editorial board of the New York Sun and the Weekly Standard. Okay. And it's like this one, and I would also include, you know, you know, elements of Human Rights Watch and this okay. lar- the larger people who kind of care about the character of regimes and the fate of dissidents. Okay. And, um, you know, sort of in that way, as opposed okay. to, you know, the sort of rail politique group. Okay. So anyway, uh, the the artists formerly known as neocons, I will call mm-hmm. you, uh, <laughs> I, would, I, I would think that um, you would not be so fully on board with the McCain program in theory, because I would think, you know, high on your list of objectives would be to reduce uh, our dependence on um, Arab oil. And, yeah. and I think there's something to be said for that, because I think, you know, Oil is the great friend of authoritarianism, yes. um, and, uh, and and so I, I would love to, to reduce our dependence on it. And, yeah. and and ironically, the way to probably the fastest way to do that is actually to raise prices, give them a windfall in the short yeah. run, and get people to start buying Priuses and stuff. And and so I would think that your actual belief in your heart is that Obama has the better policy to the extent that he's resisting things like offshore drilling, although it's not clear that he's resisting anything these days. But anyway, in theory, I would think you would not be fully on board with the McCain policy. Well, the problem is that, of course, I want an alternative energy. I think everybody does now. I mean, James Woolsey is spending almost all of his time on this Foundation for the Defense of Democracies. And McCain talks about finding alternative energy. And until you do, finding uh, new sources of oil, if you can... Uh, in uh, the Western Hemisphere, and particularly, uh, you know, in, in the United States, um, would would be a good way to make sure that you know Americans, uh, you know, do not suffer, you know, uh, you know, in their sort of personal budgets from you know the just rapidly escalating price of gasoline. And it's not smart politics to tell people that you know I have no plan to lower. Uh, the price of gasoline at the pump that affects you know, no, your... it's not smart politics. That's right. not the dispute. I mean, but don't you right. agree that if we want to wean ourselves from oil, uh, high prices are actually good? In fact, you might you might go further and raise taxes on on gas. Well, yeah, but I fear that Obama and the Democrats in general want to kind of recreate Kyoto, which um, would would give you know I don't know some sort of international body control over large sectors of our economy in some ways, and I don't think that's a good way to deal with it. I mean, we, we can no, agree no, on... No, you should think that the market is the right mechanism. So raise, let let the prices rise, right? So so uh, you should be against uh, offshore drilling for that reason. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not against offshore drilling in the interim because the price of gasoline is so high and there's other things that outweigh it, but in the long term, sure. But I think that the main thing is that we just have to, you know... So the, the no, interim being... No, until, I'm saying there's, there's yeah. no magic bullet, though, to come up with the, the breakthrough that's going to make it possible to have cars that really don't run on gasoline at all or to sort of shift the thing. It's not necessarily, I don't think, as much a policy decision as it is a question of sort of ingenuity. And as Priuses come out, you know, Priuses are back-ordered at this point. Everybody wants to buy them anyway. Um, and you know, you know what think, that does? That sends signals to the market and to other automakers right. to make more of those. That's a good yes, thing. Yes, that's I mean, a good I'm saying that is a good thing, right. Right. But so I don't, that doesn't to, necessarily mean that I don't want... In the interim, until we get there, until we have, you know, an alternative energy, then in the interim, I don't think that, you know, you know, I, I, I wouldn't like working families to be able to get a break at the pump. I mean, you, you would agree with that, too, right? There's a difference between having a long-term end goal and then, you know, in the interim, which, I mean, I think you'd have to say is sort of a political no, crisis. No, I think it's, I, I actually think it's kind of ridiculous to say, well, in the short term, I want prices to stay low. But, yes, in the long term, somewhere down the road, we should swallow high prices. Why down the road? I mean... Well, but I just don't think that the, high, the price of gasoline is going to be the main factor in coming up with an alternative to petroleum. It's going to come up, it's going to be some scientist or some lab somewhere that's going to figure out, and some business genius is going to figure out a way to do it. I'm, well, not saying, I'm, I'm just saying that is, I think that when when the technology becomes and the technology has become it, think about it like this, right? The technology to develop the Prius was developed when gas gas prices were incredibly low, 
So someone w- people are already on the problem. It's well, just you know, they were low relative to to today, but they weren't. They were thought of as being relatively high compared to yesterday. And look, well, that's that, like, well, like come Prius on, I mean. Yeah. As a conservative, you should have some appreciation for the way capital markets work. Here's I the do way have they appreciation work. Appreciation for capital markets. You, you're, you're trying to get me in a corner here. I'm not. Absolutely. I'm not I disagreeing with the it. concept. I'm just trying. To, I'm just trying to to beat you about the head and shoulders. Um, the, the 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 no, but actually, the way, you know, Bob, but, I think I think that's a great idea, and I think you, you need to you need to talk to uh, to, uh, to 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 Greg Craig and 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 the Obama campaign. You guys say, listen. Obama, here's your opportunity. Say how much you want the price of gasoline to, to go up, and I'm sure I'll win the election. Look, I'm not talking. <laughs> I'm not talking politics. I'm saying you should admit that you're. I say, oh, you're saying as, as two of us who are just journalists, we are journalists. We are writers, and we are as such, we don't have to. We don't have to be constricted by the uh, the cross currents of, of, of sort of politics, and we can just sort of speak our minds. So, yeah, sure. The price of the, I will I will certainly say that the higher price of gasoline, the more. Um, um, consumers will seek to have more fuel efficient vehicles and look to sort of lower their gas um, their gas uh, expenditure or their gasoline expenditure through conservation and in some ways uh, in terms of weaning off of foreign oil but the real thing I need to do to wean totally off of foreign oil is to have someone invent and come up with a viable alternative to oil and when that happens then we can bankrupt the house of Saud and the Iranians and the Russians but and Eli, Hugo Chavez, which would be wonderful. Eli, this is why I use the phrase capital markets. At that point, I was shifting the subject away from consumers. Right. The way capital markets work is, is, is the, the more money that can be made through alternative energies, the more research dollars are going to go into looking oh. through, for these breakthrough technologies. I assure you, GM is increasing the amount it's spending on trying to develop the hy- hydrogen oh, thing. Oh, because the gas and gasoline. Stuff. Yes, right. yes, absolutely. Okay. So so okay. it's not just sit back and wait for a breakthrough. That's not the way markets work. I know it's not sit back. I, but I guess to go back, though, I understand your point. I just don't think – I think there was, there's been an incentive for some time to come up with a breakthrough. Like, I don't believe that, like, you know, GM tried to kill the electric car. You know, I just didn't I – mean, like, I mean, I know that there was this documentary that said that. But – I think that there, there, that that, that we're, we're well beyond the point of the. the I mean, Jonathan Rauch apparently has a new book coming out on this, and was recently written about this. And I have to also admit, I'm in a position where I'm not exactly an expert, but I think that there's been quite a bit of incentive for capital markets to find alternatives to energy for a long time. It's not like it's a secret that the person who comes up with the patent for that and these kinds of technology is not going to make billions of dollars. Everybody knows that. Eli, it's not a binary thing. It's not like either the capital markets are paying attention or they're not. It's like more money can always go in, and the more money that goes in, the more people will be looking and the more research will be subsidized. It's just not a binary thing. I will say a pet peeve of mine is that I really think neocons in particular among conservatives do not appreciate the way markets work in general, and that's a, a much longer diatribe that I won't get into, but I think, I think that influences your, your foreign policy – uh, in various ways. What's that? Well, I mean, come on. I now, mean, that's I a separate know. subject. Neoconservative, depends on how you define it, but I mean, neoconservatives, if they, I don't know, do you count Milton Friedman as a neoconservative? I mean, because he, he, he certainly um, was able to, uh, through his work on just stagflation, you know, clear out a lot of sort of some of the knuckleheaded ideas that were advanced at the well. time by the Democratic Party. And if you sort of, and, I, and I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. De- I'm just. I don't think. I, maybe I just don't think it's as much of a difference. You know. I just think okay. that. Every, I think that there already is a lot of incentive to do that. And um, certainly the current. I don't know. You know what? You're. And the other. The other premise I would question here, I guess, would be: um, Does more money, whether it's government money or not, necessarily lead to that, or is it? I mean, does that necessarily affect the science? I mean, I don't know. Can you show a correlation? It's a. That's a stickier question. Sometimes I'm not saying yes or no on that, but. Scientific science, scientific breakthroughs don't necessarily follow a kind of direct linear pattern or direct relationship to the amount of money people are putting into the research on it. Sometimes well, people are researching things and it's all in the wrong direction. And then as, you know, some, as a patriotic American, I have faith in our capital markets. But Eli, we all I. choose our levels of patriotism, and whatever oh, level of wow. patriotism you're comfortable with, it's okay. <laughs> you are 
Really? You, you're, you're, you're putting me through uh, through the paces here. I'm putting you through the McCain you're challenging technique. My this is the because standard, it's like that's what I want to do. This is a standard <laughs> conservative technique, of course, in any election. Is the other can- the Democratic candidate is not a patriot. They're doing it masterfully again this year, and I'm just I'm just trying to learn from them, and I'm practicing on you. Uh, uh, Bob, I'm sorry about Bob, that. Bob, 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 I, I, I'm going to draw the line on this. Okay, the Democrats also scare voters about Republicans. Okay, for example, Democrats have been saying that neoconservatives. Uh, you know, took over the Bush administration and secretly were trying to foment an invasion of Iran or to bomb Iran and all these rumors and sort of coming out. Is, you know, there's all kinds of things like that. There's just it's just as much of being a fear monger if you if you if you sort of you know say you know that you know the, the President Bush and you know 22 neocons and Ahmed Shalabi tricked the uh, entire intelligence community into thinking Iraq had weapons of mass destruction, yeah. which no bipartisan report uh, that has studied this you know attests to, but. People still say it, and that's kind of kind of fear mongering, you know. I mean, so and the, and and they don't even get me started on Social Security and Medicare. For how many election cycles have Democrats said if you vote for the Republican, he's going to take away your Social Security and your Medicare? I'm just saying. I mean, I, I got into this before we once with Heather, but everybody does that, and it's just. I mean, you know, maybe I would, you know, but it's this Aaron Sorkin ideal that like, oh, the Democrats are too good. They have to, you know, they, they want a better uh, debate. No, they're just as bad. Everybody slimes everybody. It's what's done. Hey, Eli. Yeah. Wouldn't a cigarette feel good right now? Oh, don't even get me started because it wouldn't feel good. <laughs> I can, that's death. Well, no, because judging, <laughs> I can hear you chewing the nicotine gum, and I have I'm, to I am, you I'm sorry. I, don't mean to do, I know it's in your system. ear. Forgive me, but it is, uh, I'm chewing the nicotine gum. Yes. Yeah, no, no. God bless pen. you. God okay. bless you. All right. But, but, okay, but speaking of Iran... And, and by the way, yeah, I, I, I have to admit, I don't know where any, anybody on the left got the idea that neocons would ever favor the invasion of a Middle Eastern country. So you're right to complain about that. But the no, but they've on- explicitly said the policy has been this, you know, multilateral diplomacy. And now the debate really is, well, Barack Obama would, face to, would meet with the Iranians before they stopped enriching uranium, which is not the same as saying we favor diplomacy and they just want war, because it hasn't happened they, and Bush, when he says, if they got a nuclear weapon, it would be really bad, that's, uh, that's I think that's a, a tautological, that's obviously true. If they, we don't want the, you don't want the Iranians to get a nuclear weapon, am I right about that? Uh, I do not want them to get one, now. Okay, I'm assuming that everybody, I'm assuming the good faith of everybody in this argument, um, but the main way that the Bush administration has tried to handle this has been through, um, you know, diplomacy, pressure, but things, sort of options short of war, and as I've said before, an invasion is certainly off the table because we have a volunteer army, and the and Republicans and conservatives um, do not want to reinstate a draft. Sometimes that's talked about in terms of national service. Uh, with uh, the new Democrats of the '90s wanted a draft for national service, but generally conservatives don't like uh, drafts and sort of having the government compelling young people to do something. No, so, I. I agree that an, that an American invasion seems off the table for the time being. Yeah. But you you recently wrote an article that whether you I don't know whether you had this in mind, but it seems to me it pointed to a way conceivably Americans could get sucked into a war with Iran in a big way. The Strait of Hormuz thing. What what is it that well? I'm just reporting. Here? I should say a couple things here. Um, the Iranians are saying now openly. The head of their Revolutionary Guard on Monday after. We sent William Burns to Geneva to hear out the offer, and if you want to read the Le Mans transcript of the, uh, it, you know, Burns was on his best behavior. He was saying, we're really looking forward. We think this is a big misunderstanding. We're looking forward to talking with you. So how did the re- Iranians react? They s- claim to have tested these new anti-ship missiles, which they say has a technology that no other nation has access to, like, I don't know. You know what? I don't know what that would be, but they're saying they have a technology we don't have access to. They're saying that they have anti-ship missiles that can hit ships, enemy ships, more than 200 miles away. That's using a technology that only is available to the Iranians. Now, I think that's not true, but um, that's what they said. And then they said we could take out the enemy ships in the Strait of Hormuz. um, You know, if 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 anything happened to our nuclear program. So they're basically, and they've said this before. And so they're starting to raise this issue of closing the Strait of Hormuz. It reminds me of a conversation we had a year ago, I think, or more than a year ago, where I said, hey, they could, they could use the sort of power of, like, sort of blackmail in oil. Now, do I think that they would succeed in this? No, I think the Navy would destroy them. Uh, the U.S. Navy um, would destroy them. But they are making a, they're sort of making this say, they're saying, listen, there are huge consequences if um, it comes to uh, blowing up 
our uh, you know nuclear facilities. Now, and now one itself, of them would I mean, be closing the Strait of Hormuz. Or they. Say I mean, they you would. consider the, the the threat itself outrageous or surprising? No, I think that the American Navy is so much better than the Iranian Navy that it, it would it wouldn't really be a fair fight. I think but, that. So I think, but I mean, but I think they also may try, you know, something similar to maybe a USS Cole attack because the Iranians have no problem using terrorism to advance their uh, state. Need, uh, you know, sort of ambitions. So maybe they would try that. And I think that you know, after the coal attack, the Navy is sort of preparing to sort of how to defend against that as well. But right now, um, yeah, I think that that's sort of they, they made a very, fairly open sort of threat that they 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 could they could seize the Strait of Hormuz, and that's one fifth of the world's oil. That would cause a huge economic shock. Yeah. See, I think in a way the threat is not permanently closing it, which I, I they couldn't do, let's face mm-hmm. it, because, I mean, look, everyone would be on our side. I mean, I don't yeah. know the geography, but you're talking about significantly constricting the oil supply for the whole world, right? Yeah, yeah. I yeah, mean, I mean, you know, uh, I think China would be on our side, and I think, mm-hmm. you know, Europe would be on our side. So it's not like uh, they could pull it off. I think, in a way, the threat implicitly is to the United States saying, we could draw you into another messy war. If you let Israel bomb us, I think that's the implied threat, and and it well could become a very messy war there. You, I mean, I I don't know the answer to this question. I'm just sort of raising it, but mm-hmm. I get the impression, having recently talked to some fairly senior IDF people, that um, that's an Israeli Israeli call. Like they see it as an existential question. Not to say that they are going to do it. I'm not predicting Israeli behavior right now, but um, if they 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 they. they feel that they cannot afford the Iranians to have a successful test of a nuclear device and then get into a situation where they're just being constantly threatened. And they, they just, well, they, do you think it's a good thing. idea for Israel to bomb? I think it would be a good idea ultimately to try to you know, foment some sort of nonviolent velvet revolution regime change in Iran. It's been my position for a while. But I think at a certain point for the entire world, it shouldn't just be an Israel issue that the Israelis see it as an existential threat. But there are huge problems if the Iranians do succeed in um, getting an, a nuclear weapon. If I may say something that's really kind of unconventional, but something I've been thinking about, I actually wanted to ask you about this. Maybe, do you think the Iranian, I mean, listen, the Iran, the Persians are very clever people. I mean, they're very, it's, I don't, they're not some backwards culture. I've been to Iran once, but, um, you know, it, it, this is, I, do you think that they really don't know how to, how to make a nuclear weapon at this point, given the fact that the technology um, is out there, that they have something like 3,000 centrifuges just in Natanz, do you really think it's the question of like learning the technology, or is it a question of you know they're 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 trying to maximize this? I mean, I don't know the answer to that. What do you think? I, I don't know enough about the science. I mean, I just heard a snippet on the radio of somebody saying mm-hmm. that, that that being able to put a, a nuke on a missile and launch it, it requires a second level of technology in yeah. terms of making the weapon. Uh, insulated from the shock of launch, for example, and there, right. there's also there's a whole other set of things. Um, but of course, I mean, the basic problem that Israel and America faces is that knowledge tends to grow, you know, and right. knowledge is ultimately the problem. So if right. the desire is there uh, and the knowledge is there, the most you can do is kind of set the program back a while, and in the meanwhile, uh, an attack may, you know, may induce counter-reactions of various kinds that aren't favorable. But but Israel, I gather, Israel can't do this without, in a certain sense, expressed U.S. support, right? Because don't they, one way or another, need our clearance? They've got to either fly over Iraq or they've got to fly through the Gulf, which we... Is, isn't that isn't that kind of true? Um, yeah, but there's other scenarios. I mean, they have nuclear submarines. I mean, I don't know if that's realistic, but hmm. there's other scenarios where they maybe fly But I think, Turkey. I mean... People are saying the, cha- the, the, the challenge yeah. of really doing serious damage to this program, giving, I guess, how, how distributed, decentralized it right. is, and in some cases concealed, I don't imagine subs coming close to doing the job. Yeah, I don't think subs could do it either. I'm just saying that they have. Um, there's also, of course, sabotage, um, yeah. which, uh, which I think, you know, I think that not just Israel, I think, you know, there's a lot of people who have an interest in trying to sabotage the program. Though that's hard, too. The Iranians are excellent uh, at intelligence, counterintelligence. Um, uh, yeah, I would think one thing I would say that there's, a, there's, a, there's sometimes there's an internal inconsistency on the sort of, for lack of a better word, Iran dove side of the Iran you know diplomacy side of the argument, which is that on the one hand you're right that they say if you, you, you if, even if you bomb them you wouldn't take out the program because it's so dispersed and some of it's hidden, but on the other hand they always take the sort of the the, the rosiest estimate as to how far away the Iranians are to 
kind of crossing the threshold and being able to test a nuclear device, and that would imply that the only programs that we that, that were there were the ones that we knew about in Natanz and Iraq uh, and Boucher. So it's either either they have this this diffuse program, which would suggest they 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 actually are you know have the potential to be further along. They have other sort of things things going, um, so that you know you, you you wouldn't just count on the IAEA's monitors in the known sites to tell you kind of uh, where it was, or um, you you know or you know it, it is just limited to these things that we know about, and therefore it would be easier to sort of take out from the air. Yeah. I mean, I think in a way that the greatest problem Israel faces here is that I'm pretty sure an act like this would, uh, you know, I mean, first of all, Iran would purposefully choose to activ activate some terrorist assets that aren't sure, activated at the would. moment. But even beyond that, I, I think it would just make, it, it would really rile people up. It would make it easier to recruit terrorists. It, it would just, mm. and, and I think, I, I mean, I, I think one of Israel's longstanding... I think long an Iranian nuclear test also makes it easy for them to recruit terrorists. And it also gives them an ability to do the sorts of things that they're not doing now because, you know, the certain point, you know, I, I, it, 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 you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. I'm not disagreeing that um, the retaliation, I wrote a whole story about this about two months ago or a month and a half ago about scenarios that the U.S. intelligence thought the Iranians would do if bombed. And I agree, it's a pretty nasty and awful scenario. Um, so it would be nice to try to solve this without anybody bombing anyone. And I, you know, think that at least most people I know on the right and the left, they, they sort of agree with that general principle. I just don't know, um, at this point, I just wish people would recognize how brazen and... Uh, and, you know, how awful the Iranians are in this. And the Iranians are given a lot of opportunities. I don't think they've been provoked into this. They're really maximizing their position. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it's worked for him. I mean, I mean given his, right. his strategic goals and, and, and... So let's degrade their sovereignty. Let's do other things. Let's take their money. There's all kinds of things we can do to the Iranians short of bombing them. But, like, really understand that they're an adversary. And the other thing is this. I don't know what an agreement with the Iranians would be worth. I don't think that they... Adhere to, I and mean, this kind of gets into the broader question of the international community. I think that um, it's dangerous to think that you can you can expect rogue states to comply with these sorts of things. After all, they were part of the NPT before, and they were in violation of that. They violated the terms of the special protocol that allowed the spot inspections. Um, then they violated the agreement that they signed with the Europeans. So the Iranians sort of, I don't know. I mean, like I think that their inclusion or trying to include them in the international system does not make us safer necessarily. Well, not until, not unless we're successful. No, um, but no, but, but no. But saying it's not it's not on us. Maybe maybe the problem is is that there are certain states that just don't that, that 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 seek to subvert international law or don't recognize international law the way that uh, we do or the way that you know Costa Rica does. Well, know? my personal view is that that's not a permanent condition necessarily, uh, and and sometimes it can be the problem can be solved without regime change in the sense of, like, invading or something. Well, I'm, I'm, um, let's take invasion off the table. I'm against right. it, even if we did have, you know, I don't know, mercenaries and, or whatever. I'm against invading Iran, all right? Okay. Let's take that invasion off the table. What I'm saying mm -hmm. is that it's possible, like, if, let's say, the Hatsumi election had resulted in Hatsumi really kind of consolidating, having the real power, and that, you know, when the Hatsumi Majlis, their parliament... Uh, was managed to get through this referendum on the original Islamic Republic Constitution that sort of took the power that's vested in the uh, supreme uh, leader as well as these uh, the unelected clerical councils, like the Guardian Council. Let's say Khatami's original plan had succeeded. I think that you probably could eventually get a deal with that kind of Iranian government. So maybe an election could be the a regime change, but it doesn't seem like that's the trend we're going in, given the fact that most of the reformers have been, you know, are not allowed to run for office even on the parliamentary level, and there doesn't seem to be any real reformers in the regime right now. You kind of, as I've said before, yeah. you know, you have Maniac 1 and Maniac 2. Well, you, you know more about the, the local political yeah. conditions than I do. I mean, of course, the other thing about bombing is it tends to incite a nationalist reaction that supports whoever the leader happens well, I, to be. So absolutely, no, and, I, and I would agree with that, too, um, that you, if anyone who thinks that bombing is going to hasten regime change hasn't looked into the issue. Okay. Oh, yeah. Well, well we should we should move on to something else okay. quickly to another Olympics related issue. You know, mm. there's the uh, these uh, the Uyghurs in the West uh, staged. I mean, not all of them, but some of them staged a kind of terrorist incident, uh, much to the annoyance of the Chinese government. Mm. Killed some police 
than out in the West. Um, and I, I would think the Uyghurs, uh, these are Turkic, right, Muslim people who have long had, many of them, separatist aspirations. Right. I would think this is kind of a problem for whatever you're calling your ideology now. I mean, I mean, it, it, it's a it's a tough one for you to think you know, through. First, in a first met sense. with a with a Uyghur activist before uh, about a week and a half ago, two weeks ago at the White House, um, actually in the White House residence, not in the Oval Office, mm-hmm. um, to sort of recognize. You know, he met with you know Harry Wu and others uh, to sort of you know sort of make his piece with uh, on on human rights issues. But he did it in Washington, um, and one of the women who he met with was a a Uyghur rights activist, though I think of the kosher variety and not the terrorist variety. Right, but the problem you have is that they're intertwined. On the one hand, the the instinct of, well, certainly I would think of, you know, neocons, as we used to call them, um, is to so, to have a certain sympathy for the nas- separatist nationalist aspirations of people living in authoritarian countries, right, like the Kurds right. in Iraq under Saddam and so on. There's right. that. On the other hand, there's the fact that these people are deploying terrorist tactics. And the position of Bush, and I think many neocons, is terrorism in all its manifestations is to not be tolerated, right? So, If I may, if I may, I, I don't want to speak for the neocon line here. I'm just going to speak for myself because I've thought about it. been to China twice. Um, I don't think you're going to be able to advance freedom in China with the primary, your primary tool being the U.S. government or having it be an American national project. I think the more likely way to do that is to have Americans, and for that matter, free peoples in the world, showing solidarity and supporting, and if you will, adopting um, legitimate sort of dissidents. Like, you know, I don't agree with a lot of the philosophies of Falun Gong, but it's absolutely atrocious how they are treated in China. And while Mm -hmm. it's nice to have American diplomats, and I think they should continue to sort of mention this, there's only so far the U.S. can go at this point, because... China and the United States have a tremendous amount of, like, sort of mutual tied-up interest. Not only is there the trade, not only is, you know, the Chinese banks own a lot of our debt. Um, as I mentioned before, there's all this diplomacy. North so, Korea. Yeah, North Korea, Iran, all this other thing. So there's, there's all these things that we want the Chinese to do for other important issues. Mm-hmm. But I think that you can have an enormous effect. Listen, I think that, uh, listen, ultimately, Nelson Mandela brought down the apartheid South Africa, um, you know, for the benefit of, of, of humanity. Um, but he got a lot of help, not from the Reagan administration, if you remember at the time, but from just concerned Americans and Europeans and the power of uh, social boycotts and, and, and economic boycotts and good journalism and, and all of these things, which are not U.S. government policies, well, but and can, have an enormous effect. That, that that's actually more feasible than ever because of the blossoming of these international NGOs. And my basic, no. given all the... Given all the the prices you pay that you've just enumerated for kind of hectoring governments about human rights situations, mm-hmm. uh, I think it probably makes sense to leave that largely to the NGOs. They're international, so in a certain sense, the blowback from the, from the hectoring, I mean, not to use a, 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 a kind of normative term there, but, but um, uh, the, the blowback from the agitating is then distributed more broadly, doesn't fall only on the United States, right? These are international NGOs. They're not governments. And, and they're doing an increasingly effective job, and they have powerful levers at their disposal. And all we're talking about is jawboning anyway, right, in most cases. Well, so this, is, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is where I, I want to distinguish between two things. There's One is, like, the policy, right? Every time the ambassador in Beijing you know, meets with the Chinese foreign minister, he has to say you know, these three points about, you know, this or that, right? Mm-hmm. Or um, another example of a sort of policy would be, like, you know, Congress passes the Chinese Liberation Freedom Act, right? And it means that, I don't know, you know, I mean, you can imagine a different, a bunch of different scenarios. And these are kind of policies that are developed, you know, and then they're finally implemented a year later, and they're not really attuned to events. However, I would say this. There are moments when um, you have a, re- a confrontation like Tiananmen Square where it makes an enormous difference for not just the American president, but other world leaders to show their solidarity with the uh, students standing in front of the tank. Um, and in those kinds of circumstances, the hectoring and the jawboning mean a tremendous amount. Or, um, well, you know, I, I th- guess they do. <coughs> I mean, I, yeah. I actually think China is, and I think most people who have been there agree, is, you know, much freer 
uh, than it was 30 years ago. I mean, no not, not, not so much because the government favors this, but largely because of, of technological re- because the government yeah. wants to be part of the economy, wants to have a modern economy, right. so it has to tolerate computers and so on. Sure. And, and so I, I think, it's, I, I think the, the extent to which China is freer uh, than 30 years ago and, more, um, and less opaque to our inspection, more transparent from abroad, and similarly the reason that, that, that Chinese have more access to news for abroad, all that stuff, and also more, the government, I think, is more responsive to uh, grievances of people because they, because they use cell phones to, like, start riots and stuff. And yeah. all So I think all of that stuff has almost nothing to do with anything that was or wasn't said in the wake of Tiananmen Square as a practical matter. Well, at this point, no, but I'm saying that if you remember George H.W. Bush didn't say anything in the wake of Tiananmen Square. No, I know, but I'm saying, well, suppose he had. Do you really think that would outweigh the the very powerful technological forces that have exerted a liberating effect? Um, I mean, do you think it it would rival them as an influence? I'll go one further. There's an interesting guy named Peter Ackerman who uh, runs the Center for, um, I'm going to screw up the name now, um, for nonviolent, uh, I, anyway, it's, it's, it's a group, it's just working to sort of, with groups of civil, civil disobedience, based on philosophy of Gene Sharp, which studied uh, nonviolent civil disobedience movements. And the, he's written, and there's others, and I think Gene Sharp has written a critique of Tiananmen Square, which said that the real fault was they didn't have um, a kind of legitimate communication and political network with anyone outside of students in Beijing. So it was hmm. great for getting the world's attention, but it didn't relate to the rest of what was going on at the time in China. Um, and that, to me, is a, you know, is a fairly persuasive technique. Because there were things that I'm saying that the Chinese uh, you know, uh, democracy activists could have done to increase their odds that um, were you know, internal in terms of a strategy in, 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 in China. Um, uh, but I think you're also right with these cell phones. And by the way, it's not just cell phones now. The new technologies where you've got um, very loud and high fidelity speakers that are the size mm. of like you know your thumbprint, um, you know, or, or you know, getting mm. or getting there. Um, you know, imagine placing that you know in random places in a, in a closed society, an authoritarian system, and then broadcasting from some remote location, um, you know, anti-regime messages. The, there are a lot of possibilities that this new technology opens up, and you're right, that is going to, I think, in the end, hopefully, advantage the uh, Chinese people, the Iranian people, Zimbabwean people, and so forth. I think unless governments shut themselves off the way North right. Korea has, in which case they pay the price of extreme poverty, you know. Right. Unless they, and they have if to they steal their weapons prosper, technology, they, they can't. They don't have good weapons against democracy's arsenal. No, I, 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 yeah. I think if nations want to yeah. prosper, they got to plug into this infra- infrastructure that ultimately is anti-authoritarian, even though uh, it doesn't work overnight. It does. It does. I think work powerfully right. ultimately. So, so maybe we agree too much about this. Now, I wanted to. I wanted to uh, give you a little trouble about your, uh, you know, I listened to your dialogue with Matthew Lee, your new friend Matthew Lee. Yes. Um, you like Matthew Lee, right? He's, he's I great. do. I li- actually really, I do like him. Um, though, um, you know, I always feel, because I don't, I, I mean, I, I've covered the UN plenty of times before, but we have another guy named Benny Avni who does that for our, my newspaper. So mm-hmm. I am... Um, I learn a lot from him, but he's a, he's a great guy. He's a very he's, 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 he's smart. He's a great character. Yeah. He's he, he's a he's like you. He's a great blogging heads character. Well, thank you. And even though you no longer smoke, you're still a pretty good blogging heads character. All right. Um. So anyway, and you, you got comp- like those theater theater cigarettes. You know, like the they're not real cigarettes, but they look like cigarettes. Yeah. Are those candy yeah. ones that I used to use when I was a kid? Oh yeah, candy cigarettes. Candy cool. cigarettes. That's what you should. Will you, would you do that for us in the future, Eli? Always I can try to find candy, candy cigarettes. cigarettes. I, I, you guys, hey. I, I don't have my cinnamon sticks, but from now on, maybe cinnamon sticks. That doesn't do it for you. I'm thinking candy cigarettes. Right, and candy Eli, cigarettes. they're on the house, buddy. <laughs> okay, that's I'll the kind of company sure this right. is. I'll send in my expense report. Yeah. No, you do have okay. to file the paperwork. But if you do that, All right. we'll we'll pick up the tab. All right. Um, now, okay. So you were complaining about the United Nations because it seemed unable or unwilling to do anything about the corrupt elections in uh, Zimbabwe. And I just wanted to run by you my basic understanding of the way the U.N. works and see mm-hmm. what exactly your objection is. It seems to me the idea behind the U.N., I mean, I know there's a, there's a lot of things the U.N. pays lip service to. It, it, it likes the idea of human rights and so on. But if you look at the yeah. structure of the U.N. and really what Roosevelt had in mind and so on, the idea, it seems to me, is basically this. 
Collective security. Yes, but more, a little more generically, I would say, I mean, collective security against transborder aggression, yes, but I would say a little more generically mm -hmm. uh, than, war, than invasion per se is a problem. The idea that, look, uh, nations sometimes do things that harm other nations. Yeah. And it's good, and sometimes harm more than one nation. It's good for the world to band together and try to subdue that kind of behavior in which a nation harms another nation. And the price... As a practical matter, that we're going to have to pay for letting all kinds of diverse, getting all kinds of diverse nations to cooperate in this endeavor is to say what you do within your nation is your business. Just as a practical matter, you're not going to be able to get all these different nations, many of them authoritarian, to say, yes, we'll help police the world in terms of, of, of nations harming other nations if you also demand that you be able to change their form of government, right? So that was the basic trade-off made by the United Nations. So it just yeah, one thing I would line. disagree with that, Bob. I mean, I, I, can I give you my, my broader, sharper critique of the United Nations at this point? Mm -hmm. It's not so much... Um, well, I like the UN Charter to be something that mattered and, 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 and did sort of go on to sort of spur the transition from... Closed, closed uh, societies to open societies. But, as I said, I think the biggest problem, the crisis in the UN right now, and the crisis in the international system right now, is that the, it, it doesn't, it has a very bad track record of stopping rogue nuclear proliferation and terrorism, which are oh, the Oh, I have to interject something, Eli. I'm sorry. I hate to interrupt. Can I just say something? Yeah. In 2003... We were on the verge of crossing an absolute threshold, okay? Mm -hmm. The UN had demanded that Saddam Hussein open every facility up to UN inspection, and he was complying. You're probably going to contest this claim, I and I argue that you're wrong. Okay, tell me a facility. I, I remember reading tell your me a slate facility. piece, by the way. What's that? I remember reading the slate piece. I mean, and, I, and you were the one guy making the argument, I might add, before. Before the war, so... Absolutely, you know, I was. Bob Wright, you were like alone on this because it was like you were out there and everybody else was like, you know, banging the drums. Yeah, <laughs> I know somebody who was. But anyway, name me. Do you think you can point me to a facility anywhere in Iraq that the UN inspector said we want to look in here, and he said no? Well, I can tell you that one of the conditions of the last resolution was that not that scientists and their families were allowed to leave the country and be interviewed you know, without threats of reprisals, which had been a big problem before to get the history of the programs and so forth, and Saddam did not allow that. I know that Saddam at the time, or at least people in the regime, were threatening to shoot down the uh, U-2 overflight and so forth. And while the cat and mouse games that we'd seen before from Saddam Hussein, um, you know, you didn't necessarily see, um, there, you know, they, I don't know, I mean, maybe Colin Powell's, all of his intelligence briefing with the UN was wrong, but remember he was talking about how you know, these facilities were being doctored right before they came in. I mean, I, I don't think that, that Saddam was, like, sort of complying with his final opportunity as much as you did, nor do I think that that would have set any sort of meaningful precedent, because you remember, at the same time, we're learning the Iranians had uh, just, uh, you know, had this secret program in the Tans that they didn't tell the world about until, you know, that was sort of being resolved. And then you had the, the North Korean um, activities admitting to Yongbyon, um, and, that, and, and that activity that you would think would have been covered by the 94 Joint Framework Agreement. So my point isn't even about the UN so much. It's just about, you know, certain... Okay, but wait, but wait. I think right. it, was, it was totally unprecedented for the UN to, to demand to see any place and for a country to comply to that extent. And I think further, there is no doubt that if Bush, Bush could have gotten anything he wanted in exchange for holding off on the invasion, including a massive expansion of the UN inspectorate and an extension of the time frame. We clearly had it within our means to determine beyond the shadow of a doubt that he did not have any nuclear program. And by the way, I mean, this is a little bit of a footnote, but no one was even alleging that he had a truly, truly... Uh, dangerous, uh, a true weapons of mass destruction version of a biological weapon, because what that has to be is something 
uh, that is contagious and that we don't have a, that we don't have a vaccine for. Okay, anthrax is not contagious. It's bad. It's like yeah. a chemical weapon. But the fact is, no one was even saying we think he has a contagious biological weapon for which we lack a vaccine. Okay, so the real in terms of true weapons of mass destruction, the only suspicion was nukes. There's no doubt that mm-hmm. we could have determined beyond the shadow of a doubt that he didn't have any nukes or any nuclear program given. It was within the capacity, our capacity, to establish this amazing precedent and significantly strengthen the UN as an actual force in the realm where you claim you want it to be a force. And we completely undermined the UN. The United States did, George Bush did, and everyone who favored that invasion did. Mm. Sorry. I don't think I don't. I just don't think that Saddam was fully complying. I think there was always. I, well, I just. I, I, we're going to disagree on. I think the fundamentals of it. And I would say that, you know, your your point is about if there was more time, they could have established we, beyond. We could have had more time easily. Bush could have gotten the whole world to sign off on that in exchange for not invading. No problem. Okay. Well. Um, and you think that with that more t- more time, Saddam, you know, we would have been able to establish this with Saddam, and then that, we would have just no left, we would have left the butcher in Baghdad in place. Um, oh come on, Eli! Don't change the damn subject. Yes, I'm not changing the damn subject. I'm just saying. I'm just saying that like Call there were a lot of other things that he was doing that, that was were. That. I, okay. I mean, th- this is exactly what you pulled before the war. Is this guy so evil? That unless you're an immoral person, you have to favor the invasion. Uh, you know, Bob, I, I don't want to sort of... Before the war, I wrote one of the first pieces well, I don't mean for, you, I mean you, for your I mean old the, magazine, The New Republic, saying that there was a huge disagreement about Saddam and ties to terrorism and between, uh, you know, the Pentagon and the CIA. And uh, a lot of people have followed that story since then, I might add. But I'm just saying, before the war... I mean, I. but that said, I supported the invasion, sure. Um, I um, And I'd say that... I've said this many times. I think I said it on my first blogging heads. I don't uh, favor invasions now as a viable kind of regime change option. Okay. Well, anyway, that became I apparent just... to me, like you know, when I went to the first time to Iraq and I saw this enormous, you know, kind of contractor uh, contractors, you know, patrolling, you know, the center of the city that used to be the Baathist sort of imperial part of Baghdad, and now was sort of the green zone for the coalition forces. And I said to myself. This is going to be, you know, this is not a a, 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 a a good way to transition from dictatorship to democracy. A better model, I always thought, was um, uh, the Oppor model uh, in in Serbia, or uh, yeah, or Corazon Aquino in um, the Philippines. I mean, I can, people power. The yes, I, mean, I, I even wrote something like this for the Weekly Standard, but like O two November December, I think. I mean, but anyway, I. I, I'll look it up. I don't the know only point I was making is when you yeah. start complaining that the UN has not evolved into a, 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 into an effective institution in terms of arms control and stuff. I mean, I'm sorry, but we, we have the opportunity. opportunity. And, and, well, and I was look. my case rests more on the fact that the North Koreans and the Iranians have managed to put the, put the world in this situation and uh, right under the noses of the. International Atomic Energy Agency, and I might add, Mohammed al Baradai, the Nobel well, Peace Prize winner. Look, I, look, the the whole international system for controlling arms needs, I think, radical revision. I wish the UN were were much better at it and more powerful. I'm just making the point that if you really want the UN to evolve in that, then you've got to foster its evolution at critical stages. And we did not do that. I just don't think it follows, Bob, that that, that this this moment would have then created the precedent and then the U.N. would have been effective at that. And it doesn't even address my other point about terrorism, and I would add also genocide. So they're just saying these are three big priorities that I'd like the international system to be good at, and they're not. And I would argue the reason is is because our general response when we have an outlier or, or a rogue is to do whatever we can to get them to sign agreements, even when they break them eventually. And my thing is, I don't know what the answer is necessarily. I'm just identifying what I think is a profound problem, especially now with everything we know about black market nuclear proliferation and everything we know about, you know, how easy it is to have small cells do great amounts of damage, even without using WMD uh, in terms of terrorism. So we need a good system in place to protect the rest of us, and we don't have it right now. Right, and I should say in that regard, I agree, I agree. All right. But okay. I, good. I, I think the solution is going to come in, in the form of the evolution of more global governance. And, and, and 
Well, look, Eli, what's the alternative? I mean, look, we're, and I should, I should amend something I said about the original idea of the UN, and this is actually, I, I've, I made this point a long time ago in a New York Times op-ed, but it's also, there's a pretty knowing uh, post by Baltimore on our... Yeah, Baltimore on is a good, uh, is a, he's a, a very interesting poster. He's, a, he's critical of me a lot, but I am... Um, he's critical of everybody, but that's fine. I mean, it, but he, he, does, he does get at this whole issue of how, you know, the... Uh, the UN was not, I think, the UN was not initially set up to deal with internal conditions in nations, like that's your business. But I would say we're moving into an era when the threats, the threats posed by nations externally to other nations are increasingly uh, inextricable from the internal conditions of nations. I mean, a straightforward example is that if any nation fails to regulate uh, laboratories in a way that makes it easy to create biological weapons within that nation, it's a threat to all nations, okay? Yeah. Now, Eli, how are you going to solve that problem with something other than, than global governance involving what we traditionally would have uh, probably considered a significant intrusion on sovereignty? You can't go around, America can't go around invading every nation it suspects of no. letting people develop biological no. weapons, right? No. So what do you do? Well, I, we were talking. We've been talking about this idea of people power throughout this entire dialogue. That, to me, is the most desirable kind of transition from dictatorship to democracy. No, it, no, but I, I'm talking even uh, even a democracy that fails to regulate its laboratories. Okay. Right. I mean, increasingly, it's going to be the case that if you don't want biological weapons developed, you've right. got to have monitoring systems in university labs, right. in corporate pharmaceutical labs. I'm saying, yeah. what's your solution? Okay, this is the solution, okay? Have agreements with states where you can reliably expect them to adhere to those sorts of things. How do you verify compliance? Well, that's the thing. You're going to have to verify compliance through a lot of intrusion. I agree with you. Okay. But they're, vol hold on, they're voluntary things that states are going to sign. But obviously... Most nation states are going to sign these kinds of agreements because they also want a pharmaceutical industry and they want, you know, to get into sort of genetic, uh, you know, what is it, gene therapy. Right, and right. all of these things that, 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 that are beneficial to their societies. And that covers most nation states. I'm not one of these people who thinks most of the world is evil. There are a few, however, that that's not going to work for. Even if they told you everything you wanted to hear, we know that they're just rogues and that they so would only be in the system in order to do what North Korea apparently did and also looks like Iran's doing, which is to get the benefits of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, to get the benefits right. of nuclear technology while having no intention of using that technology for peaceful purposes. Well, first and, of all, right. there's a lot of different kinds of carrots you could use. You could say, for example, if the World Trade Organization were... Right. were in better shape than it seems to be in after the collapse of this last trade run, you could say to be a member of the WTO and earn all the trade benefits, right. you've got to comply, you've got to let, let this inspectorate inspect your laboratory. Sure, no, no, okay. no, There's a lots of kinds of carrots. So I don't, I don't yeah. think we should get sidetracked by the fact that in the case of, of nuclear, uh, the control of nuclear weapons, we, we, we chose this kind of paradoxical and almost perverse tool of right. giving people nuclear energy in order right. to keep them from developing nuclear weapons. That's not necessarily what I recommend. No, but my, point, my saying, point is, just, I think you're, I think you're going to, I think it's, I think it's, it's an important problem, but it's a fairly easy problem to get everybody to in the free world or you know most nations to sort of regulate what you're right. You got to regulate these biological. Um, you got to do all these things. But that's global I, that's governance. Fine. If you're giving an international inspector right, right. that's global governance. Um, but hold on. Well, no, it's not. Okay, it's it, that's not. I, listen, global governance. When I hear it from liberals, I'm thinking it's going to be like the EU. And they're going to regulate, you know, how many holes should be in your Swiss cheese you make in Wisconsin. All right? Well, that too. Which is that's what the EU vital, does. That's a vital security issue too. But Bio just bad, I think. Yeah, exactly. Because we're Swiss going to cheese. Okay, but my, my point, no, that, my, my point is that we, we should, like it's that. also in the international, hold on, listen, it is also in the international community's interest at this point, clearly, okay, to favor, as I do, some kind of regime change in a handful of states. We could probably name them now. The axis of evil wasn't such a bad start. So my yeah, point that is that, that yes, on the one hand, well. right, carrots for everybody, uh, on these very important, sensitive technological issues, so we can we can we can defend and ward off against 
the abuse of non-state actors and other rogues. But when you have rogue states that will not, and there's no chance, really, of them really acting in good faith in these sorts of agreements, then what's the point? Come on. You know that, right? We've we got to get to viewer comments, so I'll let you have the wor- last word. All right. Except oh, well, for this, can we please except get to the nation's letter I'm... on Obama, please? What's that? You didn't, did you read the nation's letter to Obama or the open letter? I didn't. Oh, but let me quickly add one point just yeah. to clarify. When you say you're worried about us becoming the EU and regulating Swiss cheese, I would stress I would take in, in the construction of global governance what I would call a realist perspective mm-hmm. in the sense that the only thing we want to do with right. global governance is defend national is is defend national interest through means in cases where it's no longer defensible unilaterally. That's where you pool sovereignty. You're actually the one who would go further and say, no, no, no. We want to be able to intervene to ensure democratic elections and so on. No, no, I no, say, no, 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 no. You don't don't get it twisted. Uh, my 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 paramount security issue right now is to mm-hmm. is to change states that uh, is regime change for states that ultimately we would want to have part of the, these international compacts on biological weapons and nukes and stuff like that that um, are pursuing these things kind of in a rogue way and, can't, and, and will destroy the international system if we, if we pretend that we can somehow get a deal with it they would comply with. Because it doesn't oh. work. That's fine. Okay, I really will give you the last word this right. time. Okay. Uh, you don't want to talk so, about the, the Obama, dear, dear Barack Obama. Okay, the, okay, quickly on this, on this Nate, because i got to get to some viewer comments, but, okay, there was this open letter in the nation featuring, I don't know, Juan Cole and who else? Well, no, you got the big ones, the big guns, Gore Vidal, Studs Terkel, Ooh. Uh, Phil Donahue, Phil Donahue, Barbara Ehrenreich. Barbara Ehrenreich, she is, she is deserving of uh, respect. But no, Not no, no Chomsky, are. and I don't see my, Naomi Wolf's name. Um... It's, uh, listen, I thought it was interesting for the following reason, right? Okay, first of all, let's tell them what it was. It was a letter trying to hold Obama's feet to the fire on ideology, saying quit compromising on this and this and this and this right. and this. Be a left-winger, right? Right, well, it was saying well, here are the key positions you have embraced that we believe are essential to sustaining the movement. Okay. And Withdrawal from is- Iraq on a fixed timetable. Um, universal health care. You know, okay. and, you know the, the typical left-wing stuff. Here's what I think is interesting, Okay. Um, mm-hmm. Also, by the way, some young guns on this. Uh, Matt Stoller and Eli Pariser. Matt Stoller of Blogging Head is on this letter. Yeah, and Juan Chris Cole's Hayes. Been on Chris Hayes. Chris too. Hayes is on it as well. Yeah, um, he's been on Blogging Heads. Everybody's yeah, he's been. You know, by the way, when David Brooks wrote that column recently, naming like eleven promising young conservatives or something, it was something like eight of them had been on Blogging Heads. So yeah. So it's no surprise when you see a list of prominent intellectuals and they're Blogging Heads veterans. I mean, for example, you, you've been on Blogging Heads, but go ahead. I did not make David David Brooks' column, which is fine with me. Okay. But um, anyway, my point is, isn't this interesting? Because on the one hand, you have um, one meme out there that says Barack Obama is a neo-Marxist and, uh, you know, black liberation theology and all these other things, right? Yeah. He's really a secret left-winger. Right-wing meme, yes. Okay. But if these people were so in with Obama, you know, if the American left was so tight with Obama, then why would they be writing an open letter, which is the sign of people who are worried and are on the outside? Open letters always indicate that the signers don't really have access to the person that they're writing the open letter to, right? Amen. Like, remember when Project for an American Century wrote wrote the open letter to President Clinton because there were all a bunch of Republicans and conservatives because they didn't have the power. So does this mean that, is this evidence that, like, you know, by the way, if Barack Obama is smart, he should not let any of these people in the White House, except for Chris Hayes for interviews. But other than that, he should should say, I actually don't agree with any of this. But, you know, right. So. So the, so, the, so the right-wing meme that he's a dangerous leftist is wrong, 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 as you've just pointed out. Well, I mean, I got a lot of, I got a lot of, a lot of guff for my New Republic piece on Barack Obama would probably like embrace a Reagan doctrine in fighting terrorism, but um, I find it's an interesting thing. Like, it, it, it raises this question. Is he really, like, if, they, if these people are so concerned and so agitated to write an open letter, um, do they really think that they, he shares these ideas? Why, why enumerate them in this letter, you know? You're right. You know, I'm not... I mean, I, 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 I hope... The guy's not a dangerous radical. Well, um... So I, you, you know, are, I think, I think that ways, five... Man. I think, honestly, I think that six days out of the week. But then there's one day out of the week where, I, you know, I, I say to myself, really, did he just say that? You know, sometimes he says, like, 
we're an occupation mm-hmm. in Iraq. I'm like, oh my god, wow, really? And then you read, you know, sort of stuff about his past, and I think at one point in his okay. in his life, he was he was much more left wing. But well, let's make this one of the six days instead of the one day, so that we can get yeah, through this. Okay, six out of seven so, days. We're gonna get so through. quickly on some commenters. Some of whom have yeah. commented on you. Some of them have. Yes, uh, they've like, been much they, nicer in the last few blog that, What's that? They've been much nicer to me. I know, they're warming up to you. This one uh, in the, uh, about the UN Plaza says, this was an excellent dialogue. This is the mighty puck. I actually listened after coming home from a party drunk and made it all the way through. Congratulations, Eli. Well, and that's, then, that's all uh, Matt Lee. What's that? That's all Matthew Lee. Yeah, I think that's, that's the guy who gets you through your, uh, yeah. your drunken periods. The, the, um, so East, East West says, Eli seemed unusually sweet and reasonable this time. Now, Eli, there was a time when yes. our commenters were so skeptical of you that some of them might have jumped in and said that the word unusually is redundant when you call Eli sweet and reasonable because obviously that's atypical behavior. Nobody said that. Nobody said that. And I'm uh, the well, first that, person that, to call attention to that possibility. There was a time, if you remember, when we did the dialogue from Iraq, where some of the commenters were, were just, I mean, they wanted me off blogging ads, I remember. Can I, it was a big thing. Yeah. i got to quickly give you credit. You, we're in a hurry, so you got to promise to not respond. Just right. just stoically absorb this praise, Eli, Thank okay? You. Okay. We virtually broke on blogging heads the Onbar Awakening story. This was, okay, first of all, it was before the New York Times reported it. This was you reporting from Iraq. It was before the New York Times reported it, certainly, or the Washington Post. I even think, if I recall correctly, that there was some concern about its timing relative to your reporting on it in the New York Sun. I, 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 maybe, I'm, maybe I'm misremembering that. Yeah, there was. I remember. The I remember exactly. Right. No, yeah. I think, I mean, I, may, I think maybe uh, just, this reporting was not yet happening from Iraq, that, that there was this thing that was showing signs of success called the Onbar Awakening. I think we broke that story, Eli. I'm going to claim that. Okay, just uh, okay. accept the praise. Accept the praise. Thank you. And I didn't scream at you for saying it. No, I was no. In those, those, were, I was, those, were, those were fun times. Those were, those weren't those, those were the good times, weren't they? Yes. <laughs> the beginning of the yes. Umber Awakening. Um, okay, so uh, then there's the aforementioned... Uh, oh, Wonderment says kudos to Eli for... for uh, well, first of all, she... she I don't know if Wonderman is a he or she. There's controversy over this. I'd like this to be clarified in the comment section. Wonderman says that they would be willing to bet that you succeed in your no-smoking thing and says, in any event, kudos to Eli for trying and for not being ashamed to face the public while struggling to overcome his addiction. And I agree with that, although I really would appreciate it if you could just smoke one more cigarette for us. Eli, <laughs> quickly say... say we're running out of time, and, 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 I, and I was going to read comments from... P.E., as in physical education, I guess, who backed me up on a point I made about loans, and Namazu, who didn't back me up on that point. I favor P.E.'s view, and I, I hope to get back to this in a future dialogue. Lamus, who made an interesting point about libertarians, I hope to save that for future dialogue. And Nate, who rarely drops in now, even though he was one of the kind of founding commenters, and um, and we're glad to have him You know what happened back. to Blog and Noggin? Blog and Noggin shows up every once in a while. Still, but, but he's another, out. he's another, uh, you know, uh, person whose whose frequent absence is lamented. I, I like Joel Cairo and B J Keefe a lot myself too. Do you? Yeah, even though I mean I I disagree with them, and, and then I, most of, most of the commenters disagree with me, but I, I I think that most of them, at least now, I, I I don't know. There were times when there were people. There was a guy named Random Dude who just who was just uh, said awful things about me, but sometimes borderline abusive. We haven't heard from him in a while. Good, which is a good thing as far as I'm concerned. But uh, but uh, but most of the people now, it's like um, you know, and and I just I always sort of feel like I'm just talking. I mean, the very smart audience. So well, it's nice of you to say that, and, uh, and smart of you to say myself. it if you want them to keep being nice to you. But they do. I think it's the reason I think there's hope for you ideologically for being uh, ultimately deprogrammed oh, as wow. a as a whatever you're calling neocons these days is you you see this in Matthew Lee. You see it in your dialogues with other people. You actually want to like people who are on the other side of ideological divides from you? Yeah, there's no need to um, make things personal. No, and but that's the first step to being able to see things no. from the other point of view, which I would maintain is something commonly lacking in uh, 
Well, I won't, I won't make some sort of categorical uh, claim about neocons like that. Forget I said that. But um, we should go. We, sh- we should go. And um, can you just accept that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be a, you know, just a nice freedom community guy out there in the world? And we may disagree, but we can still be friends. I can accept that. It's All just right. that I, w- I would like to slowly draw I you mean, forward. I mean, I don't know. I'm not trying to convert, you know, you or, you know, other blogging heads. I just accept No, you, you, No, actually, whenever you argue, you're trying to convince people. Oh, that's fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay. So we do that. Yeah. And uh, I have hope that someday you, you, you will be convinced. And, and we agree on some things. Yeah, I think we agreed on China. Oh, a number of things. You, you're now a big global governance advocate. Oh, uh, I don't die down. Nope. Yeah. Nope, we'll, nope, nope. I want my Swiss cheese the way I want my Swiss cheese. We're going to cut that denial out. We're going to end with me <laughs> saying you're a big global governance All right. advocate. All right. Well, thanks for filling Thank in for you. Mickey. This Thank was great. Give, um, okay. Thanks a lot, Bob. It's great.